So when the ACLU of Virginia um, decided that they were going to take this case, which is actually a pretty straightforward free speech case, um, I mean, I think the neo-Nazis got the permit first, and then the uh, freedom-loving people got the permit second, and then when they realized there might be violence, they tried to take one permit away. But it's a first-come, first-serve when you have a neutral um, application. What's different and what was, I think, and, and what's changed in ACLU policy is that they were armed. Because the neo-Nazis in Skokie were not armed, right? Um, but they were armed down in Charlottesville. And I think it really raises an interesting question about Second Amendment and First Amendment rights in conflict, right? Because when you're carrying a gun is going to intimidate me, is my free speech going to be chilled? You know, it, it may well be. Welcome to Coolidge Corner Theater. I'm Alex Schaffner, Events Director at Brookline Booksmith. Please everyone join me in welcoming Hayelet Waldman, Michael Shaben, and Carol Rose. Uh, so I thought we would start by telling you a little bit about how this book was born. And then uh, we'll talk a little bit about the ACLU. We'll talk about some of the challenges facing us all. We'll talk about some of the specific essays. Michael will read for a bit. And then we'll take your questions. So there's our roadmap for tonight. So this essay collection began uh, on the night of the election. Um, <laughs> Basically, we, like I imagine many of you, were staring at the television, horrified. I will say I was not surprised, but others were surprised. I know at one point my daughter um, sent me a text and she said, Daddy says everything's going to be okay. And I texted back and I said, Daddy is delusional. <laughs> um, so the following day, I... Um, got in touch with a friend of mine, James Essex, who works at, with the ACLU in New York City on the Gay and Lesbian Rights Project. And I said, um, James, if you ever need a couple of novelists to do whatever you're gonna need to do over the next four to eight years, to 20, to 30, we are here. Tell us what you need us to do. And I assumed that he would say, yeah, thanks. But he immediately got in touch with me and he said, we know what we want you to do. And uh, Michael and I had done, uh, our first anthology that we had done together was a book called Kingdom of Olives and Ash, in which we brought a couple of dozen uh, novelists primarily t from all over the world, everyone from Mario Vargas Llosa to uh, Jacqueline Woodson to Geraldine Brooks to um, the West Bank and Gaza, and we had them write essays about what they saw and experienced, and we collected those essays in a book. And so James said, we want you to do that for the ACLU. So I thought for a minute, and I said, I, don't, I have a great idea. Um, he pointed out that the centennial was happening this year. The ACLU celebrates its 100th year. And um, we decided that what we would do is we would approach every writer we knew and ask them if they wanted to take one of the seminal ACLU cases over the last hundred years and write an essay inspired by it. Not a, you know, op-ed piece really, not a law review article, just an, a personal essay inspired by one of these cases. Um, and we figured if we worked hard, we'd get a dozen people together and we might be able to publish this book. But in the end, every single person said yes and only one of those people who said yes dropped out. Colson Whitehead. Um, <laughs> but pe we were, people were so eager to get involved, to do something. There was this feeling like, what can I do? I have to do something. How do I personally resist? And if you're you know, a literary novelist, the direction of your resistance is not necessarily obvious. So people really wanted to feel like they were doing something. And astonishingly, the publisher, Simon & Schuster, gave us a nice advance, um, donating it directly to the ACLU, $100,000, which is incredible for a publisher, right? Let's hear it for Simon & Schuster. I mean, and John, John Legend and... Uh What's her name, Christy? Oh, well, why don't you? They can, yeah. they can, Christy Taken, they can do in like one minute on Twitter 25 yeah, times that, but still. Apparently they raised a million dollars for the ACLU on Twitter in an, an hour or something. So, so it's not that. <laughs> we do what we can. We worked for a year. 
<laughs> and we edited. Mm -hmm. And but um, but you know, none, nobody got paid for this. None of the writers got paid. We didn't. Get, but the, all of the money is going to the ACLU, and um, which is amazing. And you're going to hear a pitch from me at the end um, it, that will encourage you to walk across the street. So, Carol, why don't we start off? Um, let's talk a little bit about just how this organization was born, what its genesis was. Great, wonderful. Well, thank you all for being here, and thank you for inviting me to be with the two of you tonight. This book, I just have to say, is a fabulous reading. Um, if you are fighting the winter blues or just political despair, um, let me just encourage you to get the book, because it, uh, it's just a wonderful read, and it's the kind of book that you can go back to. Uh, time and again, and it's a great way to think about these cases and to really think about the personal stories that the authors uh, write. And the best thing, and I was saying before, is that it makes me want to go read all these authors. So, <laughs> um, and, and so it'll open up your, your doorways, not only to the ACLU and things about the ACLU and these great cases, but about the potential authors you could go out and read for those of you who haven't read all of them yet. Um, some of them I have read, but many of them I hadn't, and now I plan to. Uh, so it's a really great read, and so I'm particularly happy to be here. We're glad to have you. So the ACLU um, and the ACLU of Massachusetts are sharing a birthday because we're the oldest ACLU affiliate in the country, um, I'm proud to say. Uh, many good things started in, uh, many good revolutions started in Massachusetts. Um, and it started in the home of a woman named Margaret Shercliffe um, on Beacon Hill, who lived on Beacon Hill, and she pulled people together because they were really upset about a couple of things going on. Uh, there, were, there had been the Palmer raids, A. Mitchell Palmer was the attorney general, and they had decided uh, to go and round up immigrants and deport them and to demonize immigrants. What? Hmm, That's outrageous. Sounds really familiar. <laughs> um, and also to prevent people from speaking on the Boston Common, including women who wanted to talk about contraception. Uh, and so it was the, these issues that come around again and again and again. And while we've made so much progress in the last 100 years, the rights and liberties that we all too often take for granted, in fact, are hard won and we have to keep fighting to keep them, and we've really seen that in the last three years um, with this administration, that we cannot take for granted that the rights that we assume are ours uh, will remain ours absent a fight and a resistance. So that's what the ACLU started to do, started out to do, and that's what the ACLU continues to do today. So um, one, of the very, one of the very early cases was this case that, you know, what we did is we basically, we assembled a timeline of cases and we sent them out to the writers and we said, just pick a case first come, first served. So, for example, example, Alexander Heyman, a marvelous, marvelous novelist from Sarajevo, right? Mm -hmm. Who's um, he's married to a woman who's African American, and so he chose to write about Loving versus Virginia. And um, uh, Andrew Sean Greer, who is a Pulitzer Prize-winning novelist and who's gay, chose to write about um, uh, Windsor, which is the case that that. Um, the Supreme Court case that established the right to gay marriage for who knows how long. Um, and Michael, what, why don't you tell us why you chose your case and then um, read a little bit of it, of your essay. Um, well, I mean, I'll, I'll just say, first of all, I think one of the things that's cool about the book and the pieces in the book is that some of them are very personal and talk about um, how the case, the ruling in the case that the ACLU argued um, in is directly has had a direct impact on their lives in some way, and um, and so some of them are pretty intensely personal, and others um, tend to take a more kind of narrative approach to the case itself, and um, that approach appealed to me initially, and then um, I somebody reminded us I think about Morris Ernst, this lawyer, this great. Um, First Amendment lawyer, maybe one of the greatest First Amendment lawyers who ever lived, and he, who was a an early member. Some, it's been misreported a little bit. Sometimes it said he was a founder of the ACLU. Maybe he was not exactly a founder, but he was one of the earliest um, members of the ACLU. In any case, um, he had been involved. I knew in the famous Ulysses decision um, that the obscenity decision that allowed Ulysses, James Joyce's great novel, to be published and sold legally in the United States. And, um, and so as soon as I learned of that connection, I thought, okay, that's, I want to tell that story. And it's Just a, as an aside, the reason it, Michael is obsessed with James Joyce, and in fact, when, when one of our sons was 
in kindergarten, he wrote one of those poems, I don't know if you have kids, where they ask, they have the kids write about their parents in poetry form, and they, they give them prompts. So one of the prompts was, what is daddy doing? And what is daddy doing was reading. Dad, it said something like, daddy is, and then there were things, daddy is this, daddy is that, and then it said, daddy is reading Finnegan's Wake. Because Michael had been reading it for his entire life. For our kids, not his mine. His entire <laughs> cognitively aware life, years. Because he read it he read it through, and then he read it again uh, right after that. So as far as Abe knew, that's just what his dad did. Yeah, that was is. my job. <laughs> um, so yeah, I mean, it was a topic, it was something I'd always been interested in, and I knew it, I think, best, like a lot of people um, who've, of taking a look at Ulysses, and even if you've never gotten very far in Ulysses, you don't have to get very far at all to get the Woolsey decision, because up until sometime in, the, I think, the early 90s, every edition of Ulysses published in the United States included right up front the, the actual written decision by the judge, Judge Woolsey, in the case. And it's a really beautiful piece of prose writing in its own right. It's about two pages long, and or three pages, and um, so, Every time I read Ulysses, I read the decision first, because there it is, and also I remember from the last time I read it that I enjoyed it. So I had this regard for Judge Woolsey in particular, um, and I'm gonna read you just the last couple, two pages of my piece, and it's no spoilers. You know, the, the judge ruled correctly, in the, <laughs> and the, uh, the book was published and has been legal ever since. <clears throat> Ulysses is one of my favorite books. I adore it. And like generations of the book's admirers from the day Judge Woolsey issued his elegantly written ruling that Ulysses was not obscene and therefore could legally be admitted to and soon after published in the United States, a decision afterward upheld by the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Second Circuit, I have always been grateful to the judge for his sagacity, his principled reasoning, and his evident good taste in books. Every time I sit down to reread Ulysses, I begin with Judge Woolsey's ruling, included right up front in every US edition of the novel until the mid 1980s. And every time, say a silent thank you to that wise jurist for his integral role in bringing Ulysses to American readers like me. Having looked into the story of United States versus Ulysses, however, I now see that my gratitude has been somewhat misplaced. With no disrespect to Judge Woolsey, whose charming acknowledgement that the book does have its dirty parts, <laughs> quote, this is a quote from the judge, is ruling, it must always be remembered that Joyce's locale was Celtic and his season spring. <laughs> <laughs> Makes me smile every time. We owe the Ulysses decision less to the judge in the case than to counsel for the defense. What an incredible feat of lawyering. Morris Ernst exercised every bit of craft, persuasion, and influence he could bring to bear, from intervening in the writing of the Tariff Act, to buttressing the case with plaudits from highbrow critics and small town librarians, to manipulating the court calendar and playing on the sympathy of his opposing counsel. Even the inclusion of Woolsey's ruling at the head of the edition Random House published in 1934 was a legal strategy conceived by Ernst as a hedge against future attempts to prosecute the book. Knowing Woolsey, understanding both his sensitivity and discernment and his literary interests, Ernst played him like a violin. By presenting Ulysses, packaging it might be a more accurate characterization in a dense apparatus of erudite debate and critical theorizing, Ernst had not just made it impossible for the judge to avoid considering an alleged dirty book as a work of literature, he had also issued a subtle challenge to Woolsey's amour propre as a literary man. The moment Woolsey accepted the book's status as literature, Ernst had the judge where he wanted him. By definition, a work of literature could not be obscene, could not be pornographic, could not corrupt and deprave, could never be intended to arouse a reader, even if certain passages in said work dealt with sexual activity and bodily functions in plain, even vulgar terms. Otherwise, 
a reader like Judge Woolsey and those two mysterious friends mentioned in the ruling, in fact, fellow members of the, members of the Century Club, whose opinions as literary assessors he said he had sought, would be forced to acknowledge having found edification and truth and beauty in a pornographic book, or else sexual arousal in a masterpiece. <laughs> Both of which conclusions Ernst encouraged Woolsey to find were absurd. <laughs> Though at least one subsequent reader, crawling into the lascivious thoughts and the warm bed of soft, round, fragrant molly bloom at the novel's end, has found the line less bright between edification and arousal. <laughs> When we celebrate the American Civil Liberties Union that Morris Ernst helped to found, we tend, rightly I'm sure, to focus on injustices confronted, rights upheld, principles established, victims vindicated. We revel in the Constitution and the Bill of Rights, thrill or shudder or shake our heads at the crimes, the outrages, the victories and defeats. The history of the ACLU is a history of great struggle bitter and glorious, but it is also, it is first of all, a history of great lawyers, like Morris Ernst, who brought as much artistry and erudition and sly, masterful skill to defending one book called Ulysses as its author had brought to its creation. Lovely. So, Michael, when you were doing this research, you found out something really amazing about how um, the, the case began. So when I thought about this, or one of the very earliest cases, I assumed that the customs, some customs official, had opened up a box and found all these copies of Ulysses and was so horrified <laughs> that he, he immediately seized them. But tell us a little bit about how that actually came to be. Well, yeah, no, um, it is a, it's such a weird story. It's such a, a, there are so many surprising turns I hadn't known about. Um, I kind of had the same general impression. And it turns out that Ulysses had been, in various forms, had been smuggled into the United States for a very long time. And um, pe that was something you actually did if you were going to Paris and you were of a certain kind of you know, inclination and taste and um, means you would go to Shakespeare and Company Bookstore, which was the publisher of Ulysses, and you would buy some copies and bring them home in your steamer trunk, you know, um, and smuggle them in. And um, uh, so that when, but no US publisher up until Random House wanted to take on the challenge of, of what might happen to them if they actually published the book um, until finally Bennett Cerf had both, both the courage and the um, appetite for money because he, he, he calculated correctly if anyone ever did, and other publishers had had the same thought, like if we ever do publish Ulysses, we're gonna sell a million of them before they shut us down and arrest us because everybody, not the rep, its reputation as a dirty book had been enhanced by the fact that it had been banned for so long and that so few people had read it. So um, when they finally kind of got all their pieces in place, and as you heard, and I try to tell the story in the piece, Morris Ernst had just, it was like a Rube Goldberg contraption, and he just set everything perfectly, and all the dominoes fell exactly how he had hoped they would, except in this one place where they, one of the places they ran into trouble was they, have, they hired a Confederate, someone who was going to Paris, and he, bought a copy of the book and he brought it back in his luggage and he got off at the, um, the uh, steamship dock in Brooklyn and the, uh, uh, you know, he was put his thing, his bags to be searched and the customs agent um, like picked up the book, put it back in, locked the case and sent him on his way and they didn't seize it. And the guy w was really confused. He had been sort of prepped to expect possibly even to be detained or questioned or something like that, and he just showed up at the Random House office like, here's your book you wanted. And, they, and, you know, and Morris Ernst was horrified and outraged, and, and he's like, you know, I'm gonna march right down and make those idiots do their job for them. And he went down and he like started just buttonholing various customs agents trying to get somebody to actually, you know, arrest him or something, just seize the book so that they could actually start the legal proceedings. And one of the customs agents like, oh yeah, no, we see that all the time. <laughs> it, I mean, so fi he finally somehow prevailed on someone to actually do their job and seize the book. Um, I, I, they had taped all of these 
um, reviews, as you heard mentioned, like he, he literally packaged the book in positive reviews and essays by famous writers and so on, and they were sort of taped in, and he got the, one of the customs guys to notice that, like, look at this, don't you think this could be somehow anarchist in some way, that <laughs> we have all these sort of, these manifestos have been stuck in here, and then at that point, the guy said, okay, we'll seize it. <laughs> So, Carol, that makes me ask a question sort of in terms, general terms. How often when, you know, because the ACLU, you do impact litigation. You're looking to have not have an effect not on an individual defendant or an individual plaintiff. You're looking to have an effect on a larger issue. So how often are the cases that come to you cases that come to you, and how often are they cases that you search out, say, looking for the ideal uh, defendant or plaintiff? Right. Well, so that's a great question because we do do impact litigation uh, as well as other things. We also have a field program and a, uh, and a legislative program. So we do what we call integrated advocacy. And so the interplay between the field program and the legal program is incredibly important because our field people are out doing know your rights trainings in communities that are particularly impacted and working in coalition with people. So we often hear about cases. So we may have a, a legal theory that we're looking to test to do law reform but we have connections in communities where people are most affected by uh, oppression. And we're able to work with them and to help them find their own voice and their own agency. And they'll often come to us and say, oh, well, if you're looking for that, I know my friend or I, my family member or whatever. So a lot of times it's this interplay between our field work uh, in the community uh, combined with the litigation work. Um, so it's not just... Uh, you know, waiting for the phone call to come in over the transom. Right. Can you think of a specific case that, in your experience, where there was something that you guys really wanted to work on, and you were, say, soliciting people who could, or not necessarily soliciting, but looking for defendants who could, say, um, exemplify the situation that you wanted to? Sure. I mean, I think the most relevant right now has to do with what's going on with immigration. Uh, so there have been any number of cases that we've had. Everybody has heard about the separation of families at the border. Um, the ACLU nationwide has already reunified more almost 6,000 children uh, with their parents nationwide. Yeah, it's amazing work. Um, but now they're pushing the people over across the border because the ACLU was litigating um, about the conditions. They were putting um, children and, and other people into ice boxes, so to speak, uh, really cold places and holding them. So the Trump administration didn't want to have these lawsuits coming. So they're actually pushing them back across the bridge. And one of these places is at uh, Nuevo Laredo Bridge uh, across from Brownsville, Texas. Um, and into a town called Tamaulipas. And in Tamaulipas, it's so dangerous that the State Department has actually declared it a level four of dangerousness for, as a travel advisory, meaning it's like Syria or oh Afghanistan. Um, and so uh, there are about 60,000 people who've been pushed back across the border who are living in these encampments, and they're being preyed upon by uh, gangs um, who kidnap them for ransom and uh, rape them and rob them and, and otherwise um, it's incredibly, incredibly dangerous. And in fact, Custom and Border Patrol agents aren't allowed to go out at night because it's too dangerous um, for them, uh, but not too dangerous for these children and the families. So um, we've been working for a really long time, the ACLU, and we every state affiliate is independent, um, but we're um, confederated. Uh, so when you become an ACLU member, you're a member of the ACLU of Massachusetts and the national ACLU automatically, and we share money. In fact, we send money out to places like Mississippi and Alabama and Georgia where the need is great and the resources are small. So it's this wonderful kind of confederated network that we have of ACLU affiliates. So we've been talking throughout the nation about trying to find ways to challenge this return to Mexico policy. Um, and so recently, uh, we got a call from, and, and again, because we go out, we are active in affected communities, we got a call from a pastor uh, of a woman and her two daughters, three and five, who had recently come across the border um, and had made it to some other family members in Ashland. They, they were from Guatemala, and they had been targeted um, because the husband had seen a murder. Uh, and so, he was given a death threat and in fact shot. And so they decided they needed to leave. He survived the shooting. So they came across and Maudie and the two girls came across the Tamaulipas Bridge last July. Um, and three days later, this return to Mexico policy went in and Hans and his son, Hansito, who was eight, came across later. And, and the reason they came across separately is that's a, a tactic. Because if the dad and the mom and the three kids came across, they would take the dad away. And so they were trying to make sure the whole family got across the border. Um, but Hans and Hansito were not allowed 
across the border. And they presented themselves legally for asylum. These are asylum seekers, right, from death threats. Um, and so um, Mahdi and the two girls made it to Massachusetts, and Hans and Hansito were forced back across the bridge. There was an attempted kidnapping. They went into hiding actually in a basement of somebody over there where they had been in hiding for seven months. So um, when we were working through the churches and working community and they heard about this, they said, oh my gosh, that's what happened to Maudie. Um, why don't you go talk to her? So we went to talk to her and we were able to bring a claim on behalf of Maudie because you have to have a person in the US. The reason the Trump administration has done this, you can't get jurisdiction when they're over there. Uh, we were able to bring a lawsuit and I'm really pleased to say that last Thursday, Hans and Hansito arrived at Logan Airport. Oh my God. <laughs> um, wow. Yeah, and so we had this amazing reunion. It was just amazing and amazingly remarkable. And what was among the many things that were great about this, um, I mean, mostly that we got this family reunified, um, but a lot of immigration lawyers showed up. Um, the word suddenly got out, and all these people who weren't in the case showed up, like people who were doing the day in and day out immigration work, not impact litigation. And I was like, what are they doing here? And one of them said to me, oh, we lose day in and day out. Let us come when we win. Um, let us be a part of this. And I was like, open up the doors. Let them, you know? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, and so that's, and you know, my response was like, isn't this great? Now, you know, there's 60,000 people. That's you know, 59,999 mm -hmm. to go. Um, so our work continues, it's not like we're done, but we, we've, the cases arise that way because we have a, a really wonderful network of affiliates across the country where we talk to each other, we work together, and we have this integrated advocacy where the lawyers are working with the field people together to try to craft a broader approach than what we've traditionally had, you know, just going, to, we can't just go to the courts and we're going to win anymore. It has to be a large movement, which is why all of you and the writers here are so important to this, because each of us has a role to play in this resistance. It's not, you know, the lawyers alone are not going to fix the problems that we're facing and the threats to civil rights and civil liberties. It requires the artists, the teachers, the neighbors, the, 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 the doctors, all of us have to play a role in doing this. And when we work together, we actually do win. Um, but it requires all of us. And that's why this book is so important to me and so speaks to me so so strongly. Oh, thank you so much, Kara. That's that I'm, I'm, I've now managed to gather myself. I was tearing up before. Um, one of the things, you know, to that end, I just, the, the thing, one of the things, the experiences of, of doing the book that was so amazing was People started handing in, taking their cases and then handing in their essays. And then Scott Turow, um, I'm searching through the text to find out the name of his essay. Scott Turow called me and he said, you're not gonna like this. And I was like, what am I not gonna like? He said, I'm writing about Buckley versus Vallejo and I think the ACLU is wrong. So I said, go for it, go ahead, write about Buckley versus Vallejo. And um, I called up Anthony Romero, the head of the ACLU, and I said, I just want to give you a heads up. And he's that one of the essays in this book, Celebrating Your Centennial, is going to say that you made a mistake. And he said, awesome. That's, this is a book about the ACLU. That's the point. Um, so uh, Scott's, Scott's essay about Buckley versus Vallejo talks about um, that, that first case and then what ultimately led to Citizens United. And the notion that... Um, that, uh, in a nutshell, that, that corporate speech is speech and that it qualifies for protection under the First Amendment. And I wonder, Carol, if you could talk to us a little bit about the ACLU's position on that and why the ACLU took the position it did and you know, if, there, if you're willing to talk about any internal uh, debate that there might have been. Right. Uh, nothing the ACLU likes more than defending the right of people to attack the ACLU, right? <laughs> uh, we love it. Um, no, but seriously, um, there's, there is actually a joke that says, if you, dis if you agree with the ACLU 75% of the time, you're probably an ACLU member. If you agree with the ACLU 50% of the time, you're a board member, <laughs> uh, which is actually true. So the whole question of campaign finance, you know, speech is, is money, speech, or corporations, people. Um, that has been debated more than any other topic in the history of the ACLU. I think there have been 27 national board votes. This is a national board issue um, over the years. And they basically are kind of don't have a position. So in Citizens United, the only position the ACLU took on amicus was actually to, to challenge the part of the law that said you cannot say a candidate's name in an issue ad for 60 days before an election. In other words, you can't use actual speech to say a candidate's name for 60 days before an election. And they challenged that because the 
organization was so uh, riven uh, about what to do about it. And so that's where they ended up. And so everybody goes, the ACLU did Citizens United. I'm like, uh, not actually. Mm -hmm. um, that noted, um, there are many of us um, who think that the decision was a wrong decision by the Supreme Court. I think it's possible to say that, in fact, speech is implicated and we're going to regulate it. We do regulate speech. You know, hostile work environment is a regulation of speech. Obscenity is a regulation of speech. Uh, hostile learning environment is a regulation of speech. So we regulate speech all the time. You're not allowed to put up a political poster in a voting place, right, in a polling place. Um, so the notion that we can't say that, that, that there is a, it, that money is used to fund speech is, is, it just is. That doesn't mean we can't regulate it. And I think the court did the wrong thing by refusing to regulate it, because I think there's a competing state interest in fair elections um, that gets us there. That noted, that is what the court ruled. So what do we do now? And that's where I would like to sort of pause for a moment, Absolutely. because um, there are a lot of things that we can and should be doing now, going to back to the um, public financing for elections. We should be working on fair equal time rules on our, for, through the FCC. So there's a lot of steps that we can take to actually regulate more of the money in speech. Um, and I think we should take those steps. The thing I don't think we should do is push for a big constitutional convention. Because when you have a constitutional convention to open up and renegotiate the First Amendment, given who's in power right now, I'm not sure we're going to get a result that we're gonna be very happy with. Mm -hmm. My guess is, in general, when you do that, the people who have the power are gonna get more power. Mm -hmm. And the people who don't have the power are gonna have less power. Um, so I just would put that out there as like the, the critique of what's wrong with it is one thing, but it's a little like Marxism. Great critique of capitalism. Not necessarily the best alternative. And I think we need to be mindful of distinguishing between the critique and the alternative as we talk about the role of money in politics. Um, and then the last thing I'll say, we've brought a series of cases, um, one up to the Supreme Court, one in Maine and two uh, in Massachusetts. One was out of uh, Lowell and the other was out of Worcester, um, having to do with the right of poor people to beg. And it turned out, interestingly, Citizens United was quite important in that case um, because there were these anti-panhandling ordinances because um, the, you know, the businesses don't like to have poor people asking for money. And, uh, and one of the lines we were able to say is, if, if it's true that the court says that money is speech, then certainly a person's using actual words to say, brother, can you spare a dime, cannot be unconstitutional. Um, and so you know, we're working within the current jurisprudence of that. Um, I think it can, and I think it will change. Uh, but in the meantime, I think it's about finding ways in the courts to bring other cases that begin to chip away at the worst impact while moving into the regulatory framework through the FCC to get some regulations to try to make sure uh, that it doesn't dominate. And the last thing I would just say is, um, you know, I think, and I think the really pernicious part of money in politics isn't just in elections. I think it's throughout, as we're seeing now with the current kleptocracy that we have. But um, I think if you look at people like Liz Warren and Bernie Sanders and others, you're seeing that there are ways to rise up and to do small crowd sourcing uh, as a way to still make yourself relevant as a politician. So that also gives me hope that despite an opinion that I personally may not agree with, um, there are uh, leaders who are rising up and people behind them who are rising up to try to uh, overcome the bad decision by the court. That's great. Um, so one of the, you know, when I was trying to think when we were putting this book together, when the first time I ever heard of the ACLU, my parents were members for as long as I, and yours, yours too, right, Michael? Mm -hmm. um, but the first ACLU case I ever heard of or situation I ever heard of was Skokie. And it was Nazis marching in Skokie. And, um, a, a predominantly Jewish suburb of Chicago. Exactly. And I remember, I mean, how many of you remember that from... So that's really this notion of... And, and that's how I learned about free speech, because it seemed to me incomprehensible as a little girl that it would be... Oh, that it was, you know, things were either good or bad, right? That it could be good for Nazis to be allowed to march. And surely the good guys would be saying that the Nazis can't march. And when my parents, um, when my father specifically explained to me what free speech meant and why, and there was that old, you know, 
uh, I may not agree with you, but I will defend to the end of my life your right to say blah, 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 however that goes. Mm -hmm. um, that it was very difficult for a child to understand, but once I understood it, I feel like it shaped everything I think about the United States Constitution. Same. It was the same for me too. Like that was the moment when I first understood how hard democracy is. Like, right. like that it comes up against these things that common sense would seem to say are wrong, but there's a deeper, more important principle at work that can be very hard to understand sometimes. Absolutely, and there's a great essay by a young novelist named Moriel Rothman Zecher in the book. It's called On Jews, Blacks, the KKK, Ohio, and Freedom of Speech. And he's um, one, of the, one of the terrific writers in the book, one of the lesser known writers, but he was just named one of the five, National Book Association's five under 35 novelists to watch. And this is one of my very favorite essays in the book. But I wanted to ask you, so, um, things. What is is there a difference, or, or or what is the difference if there is one between what was happening in Skokie back then and what happened in Charlottesville, or is or we're seeing now? Like, is there? Do you see a distinction between those two movements and the 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 kinds of protests and and what is what has the, what's the ACLU's approach? Has it changed? Is it the same? Right. That kind of thing. Yeah, I mean, our approach has changed, and the world has changed. Um, so I think that the I mean, I think one of the wrong lessons of Skokie that some people got was, oh, if it's an unpopular client, it must be righteous. Well, not necessarily true. <laughs> um, so when the ACLU of Virginia um, decided that they were going to take this case, which is actually a pretty straightforward free speech case, um, I mean, I think the neo-Nazis got the permit first, and then the uh, freedom-loving people got the permit second, and then when they realized there might be violence, they tried to take one permit away. But it's a first come, first serve when you have a neutral um, application. What's different and what was, I think, and, and what's changed in ACLU policy is that they were armed. Because the neo-Nazis in Skokie were not armed, right? Um, but they were armed down in Charlottesville. And I think it really raises an interesting question about Second Amendment and First Amendment rights in conflict, right? Because when you're carrying a gun is gonna intimidate me, is my free speech gonna be chilled? You know, it, way, it may well be. And so a week later, I don't know if you all remember, they came to Boston, to the Boston Common. And uh, I was like, wow. So we had all these requests for representation. Um, we had requests by neo-Nazis to represent them. And then we had requests by the Trotskyites and the Maoists. <laughs> it was awesome. Like, who knew? <laughs> it was great. Back we go to the beginning of the last century. <laughs> exactly. Um, and... I was, yeah, I was like, wow, what, how, how, do we, how do we navigate this, right? Because each affiliate, we make our own decisions. And I was given kind of a lifeline, I have to say, by the then Boston Police Commissioner, Billy Evans, who went on camera and said, we're not gonna let any journalists onto the Boston Common, because we don't want that hateful speech getting out. <laughs> I thought, yes, get me a journalist. <laughs> so I have a client, because I want to represent the First Amendment. Right, that's who I want to represent. Yeah. But we do so much racial justice work now that it really feels wrong and conflicting to necessarily, I mean, we defend words not because they're weak, but because they're powerful, right? And words do have an impact, and people with guns marching have an impact. So we were able to sort of navigate and be able to bring the same principles forward, um, but in a different way of doing that. And then we also marched with the 70,000 good people of Boston and Massachusetts who marched against white supremacy. Uh, because we too have free speech rights as an organization and we can raise our voice for what we believe in and um, anti-white supremacy is one of the things the ACLU also stands for. So we, on the same day, we were able to do both defending free speech but also defending equal rights. And that's the balance that we're always trying to navigate. And whenever anybody pits it as one versus the other, I'm always trying to look for that center ground because, you know, I mean, the free speech movement arose because Dr. Martin Luther King and Stokely Carmichael and Harry Belafonte and these other people needed to have free speech for the civil rights movement. Right, that's where it first arose. And now we have the situation where people on the far right would like to own free speech. Um, and I don't, I'm, not, I'm not willing to cede that. I'm not willing to cede that. I think we all need to have free speech. And because if you begin to cede that the power to decide what speech is allowed versus what isn't, and you cede that to the government, then in this government, it's gonna be going to the powerful and the historically 
you know, people who have power and the privileged. It's not going to go to the people whose rights are oppressed or the underprivileged. So the defense of free speech is, I think, we need to defend it in such a way that we enhance equal rights and we enhance the voices of the traditionally oppressed rather than the other way around. But on each individual case, how we navigate that, that's the challenge. Um, and that's the work that we have to do as a society and certainly as the ACLU. Well, that seems like a great note to turn it over to questions. So um, thank you all. And Alex, you'll let me know when it's the last question. And so t who would like to begin? Yes, right up there. Thank you. Um, just following up on your point about navigating free speech, can you speak a little bit about how the ACLU's views on Facebook's position, supporting, apparently supporting Facebook's position, constitutes this kind of navigating of First Amendment that you were talking about? Does every, did everybody hear that, or do you need me to repeat the question? So he's asking, yeah, he's, he's asking about the ACLU's position on whether or not Facebook should monitor ads. I'm going to be really honest with you. I don't know why that is their position, so I don't want to pretend or, or defend it because I don't actually know the answer to that question. Um, I do think that synthetic media or deep fakes um, are something that we're going to increasingly need to be confronting um, because I think uh, things like face recognition, which is one of the things we're pushing for a ban on face recognition. I'm proud to announce that Brookline is one of the first cities that has actually put a ban on the government use of face surveillance technology. Um, the first was actually San Francisco because that's where they built it and they know how pernicious and dystopian mm -hmm. it is. Mm -hmm. um, so I actually have a very deep interest in that and if you want to talk afterwards, I'll see if I can get you an answer, but I don't want to pretend that I know the answer when I don't. Thank you. Next. Yes. Uh, hey. Hi. Uh, so, uh, Carol, I wanted to just engage you about, you mentioned the conflict between the First and the Second Amendment, mm -hmm. and which struck me in terms of the change in um, Second Amendment interpretation from the, what, like 70 odd years where right. the Supreme Court was very clear that it was not a personal right, right. to that you know, incredibly well orchestrated campaign with the Federalist Society and such to redefine that, that in, right. you know, in which puts, you know, I mean, it convincing Scalia that the Constitution was living, but you always said it wasn't public. So, <laughs> what, where, where is the ACLU these days on the Second Amendment interpretation and is it a personal right? Right, so where's the ACLU on the Second Amendment and individual gun owner rights? I just wanna say, first of all, like the whole dispute that we've had all these years on the Second Amendment just shows what happens when you have bad writing and bad copy editors. So if we just had <laughs> authors and writers doing this stuff, we would avoid so many headaches, you know? Um, so the ACLU's position, it, traditional ACLU position, um, the national position and the ACLU of Massachusetts position is that um, the Second Amendment gives a right to states to have militias. Okay, and that Heller, the Supreme Court decision that said it's an individual right was wrong. Okay, now, because we have this confederated, cool, webby thing that we do at the ACLU, there are a number of ACLU affiliates that have come out on the other side and been in favor of, have supported the interpretation of the Second Amendment. Places like ACLU of Texas, and ACLU of Wyoming, and ACLU of Nevada. Um, and it's great because um, apparently they uh, have some discussions like, do you have open carry in your board meetings? And I'm like, wow, my board meetings would be so much more polite. <laughs> I'm thinking about changing. Um, so anyway, so the ACLU of Massachusetts and the, and the national ACLU thinks Heller is wrong. It's not an individual right. However, I per, and I, I'm, uh, I've always personally believed that as well, but I'm starting to sort of rethink it a little bit in the following way. If, in fact, Heller is, I don't want to say they're right, but let's say it's the law of the land, right? The fact that there's an individual gun owner right does not mean you cannot regulate it. I mean, there's a right to travel, but it doesn't mean that you don't have to get a license to drive a car you know, or get a passport to travel. Um, you know, there's, there are a lot of rights that we have that are regulated. And so perhaps even if, I don't, again, like I don't agree with Heller, but even if we were to say that Heller is what it is, so we have to figure out how to go forward through it, I still think that there's an opportunity for states to regulate gun ownership, even if you say that it's an individual gun owner right. And in that sense, I think, you know, the NRA just has it wrong. It, it's not a free-for-all. We do, you know, we say we have free speech. We regulate speech all the time. So all of these rights that we have, the fact that you have a right doesn't mean it's not regulated. Um, so maybe, and I started thinking about it during the whole uh, legalized marijuana uh, debate that we were having here, and we kept calling it tax and regulate. Like, if it's legal, you can tax and regulate it. Well, 
you know, if it's an individual gun owner right, you can tax and regulate it. Amen. Yes, in the back. Uh, I'm just curious how the ACLU kind of manages different competing priorities, because there are so many different things that could be a case. Is that something that happens at the affiliate level, or is that kind of national? Mm -hmm. How do you choose? Um, great question. So it's both. Um, so uh, again, we don't, I don't work for the national ACLU, so my organization, my statewide organization goes through its own process, and we have um, you know, a process orientation, so we say things like, is there a political opportunity? Uh, uh, does it meet all of our goals? You know, sort of we go through a process of setting goals. It was cute, the first time I did priority setting with my staff, they came up with 38. Um, priorities. 30, and, I was like, <laughs> and then they said, let's just say tikkun, just heal the world. And I was like, no, that is not priorities, though. Um, so we do that. But we also, the national does it as well, and other states do it. And then what we do is we have strategy sessions where we talk together and we try to align our strategies, because if we can align our strategies, we're going to be way more powerful. Um, and so I like to think of it as um, voluntary uh, cooperation across the, the states, um, and it really works really well. But we have a process that we go through, um, and it's hard. I mean, it's a great question because it's not simple. And in particular, when rights are in conflict are the times that it's hard. Um, but I'm always looking for that dialectic. Over there? Yes. Um, Michael, you said you've been reading Finnegan's Wake your whole life? <laughs> no, no, I was reading, she said I was, I was reading it for our then five-year-old son's whole life. <laughs> was for his whole life. Ask, did you ever figure out what is going on? <laughs> yes, do you have any tips for me? Yes, it can be summed up in a single sentence. But I won't do that for you, but it can be. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I wrote, a whole, I wrote a piece about it after I had read it a couple of times that um, you can find at, on the New York Review of Books website um, where I tried to report on my journey. Um, and, um, uh, you know, it's not, I, I'll, I, having read it twice, I may not ever read it, read it again. Um, but whereas with Ulysses, I, I know I'll go back to that. Like that book, and then the short stories in Dubliners, those are the things that I think he, where he just exceeded almost any other writer in English at least of his time, and um, so, but Finnegan's Wake is, to me, I think I count it a failure ultimately, but it's a really fascinating, interesting, often amusing, um, and sometimes even delightful failure, but. I got for you a season, then I, 30 pages of Finnegan's Wake, I guess. Yeah, okay. no, uh, you need a lot of hand-holding to get through it, yeah. and there are a lot of people out there who will hold your hand. So. Guys, um, I am, we're going to close now because there's a movie starting here, but I want to I talk to you about something incredibly important. There are three entities that are going to benefit from what I'm going to ask you to do. One is the ACLU, who gets all of our royalties from this book. The other is Brookline Booksmith, the bulwark against the terrifying hegemony of Amazon. I cannot tell you, as someone who absolutely... What always happens in independent bookstores is people come in and they get the benefit of the brilliant booksellers and they ask for their recommendations and then they order the books from Amazon on their phone. Not okay. We need institutions like Brookline Booksmith and Simon & Schuster, which went out on a real limb here and spent a lot of money on this book. So please, I am begging you, I never ask this for my own book or for Mike, don't even buy, don't buy our books. Buy this book. Mm -hmm. Buy two, please. We need it's it to do well Valentine's for gift. all of these organizations. Yes, it's exactly. One for it's you a, and one for your sweetie. Exactly. All right, thank you guys so much, and we'll see you across the way. Thank you. Thanks very much.